So we're about four weeks into our grow. We have our seedlings in four inch pots, our tent is set up, and the time is fast approaching to get them shifted into the full vegetative stage and say goodbye to the seedling stage. In today's video, we will review transplanting into one gallon pots and review everything you need to know to optimize your tent lighting for the vegetative phase. I'm Dr. Judd with Green Cert MD. Let's get into it. So first, I just wanted to take a quick second to thank all of you who have been so very supportive of our efforts here with this new channel, as well as those of you who wished me well as I dealt with my first experience with kidney stones. I'm doing great, we got the stone all broken up without any complications, and I'm eager to get back on track making great content for you. Also, if you're new here, welcome! Please take a minute, click like, smash that subscribe button, and ring the bell to make sure you're notified when we post new content. So we are about four weeks out from our seed germination and about two weeks out from our first transplant of our starter plugs into four inch round pots. So the first thing I wanted to address was the possibility that you have some seedlings that are starting to grow at different rates. The cause of this is likely multifactorial. First, if you popped seeds from a few different strains, genetics are always gonna play a role in the rate of growth in plant size. For instance, Bruce Banner tends to grow very large plants whereas Blue Dream tends to be much more finicky and slower growing in comparison. If you have different sized plants of the same strain, this may indicate phenotype differences between them. Different sizes also could occur due to different nutrient uptake between the plants, differences in light exposure, and honestly, that's okay. Many growers tend to think of their plants as their children, and just like real kids, there can be variability between them, and right now we have plants germinated from seeds, which you can think of as siblings. At the end of the vegetative period, we will be going over how to take clones of your plants, which is basically turning a small branch from a mother plant into a new plant. The main difference here when compared to starting new seeds is that you can take multiple clones off of a single mother plant and they will all be identical, genetically speaking. We will cover cloning in much greater detail in a future video, but stay tuned to the end of our video for our pro tips and tricks regarding how to deal with small plants of different heights as we move them into our larger grow tent. But first, let's get these guys transplanted into one gallon pots. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Hey doc, why didn't we just go straight into one gallons with our starter plugs? Well, I tend to step through container sizing, starting with a four inch round pot, followed by a one gallon container, and then a five gallon container. And I do this for purposes related to watering. If you missed our video on watering, click here to check it out. So what we're striving to do is strike a good balance between having a large enough environment for the root system that it has room to grow and not be root bound, but also have an environment small enough such that we are not promoting root rot by having just too much moisture always saturating the roots and starving them of oxygen. I have found that it works for me to start the smaller, less established plants off in a four inch round pot and then transplant them in two to three weeks to a one gallon pot, which has about four times the space of the four inch round. I then make that same jump again with a larger, more robust plant when I go from a one gallon to five gallon. When trying to determine when is the best time to make that switch, I actually use the rate at which I am watering a plant to help determine when I should transplant it. So if I have a plant which over the past week has gone from watering every three days, but now demonstrates new growth, a quicker drying time, and is requiring watering every 24 to 36 hours, especially if it is starting to wilt, I know it's time to move it to a larger pot. So just like we did before, I'm using Fox Farms Happy Frog Soil, and I'm gonna use my Mycos Mycorrhizae, and we just really repeat the process we used initially to plant our starter plugs. I am placing about four scoops of soil into my container, making sure we're keeping the base of the plant about one inch below the lip of the gallon pot. And when I have that much in the bottom, I'll remove the plant from the four inch round pot, place it in the center, and place soil all around it. I will gently compress that down and then fill in until the container is full. I will then water it with a pH balanced solution containing our mycorrhizae. Now, at this moment, many of you probably have questions because I just used a transparent clear pot. So full disclosure, I'm actually doing this so we can see the root development over the coming videos. And there are good reasons not to do this as light is generally not available underground to the plant's roots. And having light this deep can also promote algae growth. So my recommendation is to use a regular black pot, 
whether fabric, air, or traditional. And I'm actually going to place this clear pot inside a black one to take away that light exposure, except for purposes of uh, illustration for the camera. So now we've got our plants in one gallon containers, and I will use risers set in saucers to keep my plants elevated out of their drain water. These risers and saucers are actually for five gallon pots because that's where we're headed. And you can actually save some money by choosing saucers and risers for the largest pot you plan to grow in instead of stocking the entire range of sizes. So where should I place the plant in the tent? Well, in this representative chart, you'll see the most light is of course right in the center. So if you only have one plant, that would be the place to put it. But most of us have more than one plant, and in my case, I have four, so I am going to place them in a square configuration with the goal being to make sure they get roughly the same amount of light energy as the others. If I were growing six, I would place them in two rows of three with the smallest plants in that higher middle zone of light. Once we place our plants, we need to position our light. We generally are looking to be between 12 and 24 inches above the top of the plant canopy. With my first grow, I just used a measuring tape, set it at 18 inches, and placed the light at that height above my tallest plant. My light had no control beyond on and off, and you know what, the grow seemed to turn out okay. So if you're on a budget, you can always start there, but be aware of the signs of either too little or too much light. Just like with watering, I again want to make sure I am in the Goldilocks zone of neither starving my plants of light energy, nor cooking them with extreme light intensity. Signs of too little light include slow growth and stretching. Stretching is where the plants aggressively reach for the light, and this results in large internodal spacing and a thin spindly stalk. On the other hand, signs of too much light include bleaching, which is a lightening of the leaves to a pale yellow or white color, as well as tacoing or downward curling of the leaves. So how do we dial in our lights to know that we have the optimal amount of light on hand? I have found the easiest way to dial in the light is to use a meter to help provide some consistent data on which to base my decisions. There are two basic meters you could use, a lux meter and a par meter. Let's start with lux. So a measurement of one lux is equal to the illumination of one square meter surface that is one meter away from a single candle. Another way to put it is that lux serves as a unit of measured brightness as perceived by the human eye. Our eyes are much more sensitive to yellow and green wavelengths of light as opposed to blue and red, so lux doesn't tell us as much about the intensity of light that's useful for plants, i.e. the wavelengths that drive photosynthesis. In contrast, photosynthetic photon flux density, or PPFD, measures the amount of photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR, that hits a square meter each second. Therefore, PPFD can inform users about the concentration of the useful light their plants are receiving. So if PAR is what we really want to know, why would we use LUX? This generally comes down to cost, as instruments used to measure PAR can be more expensive and therefore less accessible to the home grower. While lux meters don't reveal the density of the photosynthetic light, they do come in handy when it comes to light placement as they provide a method to quantify the amount of light at a certain distance, which can serve as a guide for light placement. So roughly speaking, you're going to want to start with 5,000 to 7,000 lux during the clone and seedling stage, increase that to 15,000 to 50,000 lux during the vegetative stage, and end with 45,000 to 65,000 lux during flowering. So using this meter here, affiliate link in the description below, you'll see we have a measurement of about 19,000 lux. I can take that data, and as my plants increase in height, I can periodically check, generally once or twice weekly, and adjust my light's height to keep about that same amount of light at the top of the plant canopy. Going back to PAR, while a true professional grade PAR meter will run you several hundred dollars, there are now sensors which can interface with your phone and even now a few apps which will give you the ability to measure PAR and PPFD. I have this one, Amazon link below, and it seems to be doing well so far. While it was twice as expensive as the Lux meter, this was still an affordable option and I will have to report back to you how well it does and how it holds up over time. 
Recommended PAR measurements are between 100 and 300 micromoles per square meter per second for seedlings, 250 to 600 for the vegetative phase, and 500 to 1,050 for the flowering phase. The great thing about measuring PAR, however, is that it allows you to calculate the daily light integral, or DLI. This is the most important measurement for plant lighting because the DLI is the total sum of photosynthetic lighting intensity measured as PPFD over a 24-hour period. In short, the DLI is a measure of the usable light your plant receives over a day. Ultimately, supplying adequate light intensity and duration, i.e. the DLI, is the single most important factor when it comes to plant lighting. Optimizing DLI helps reduce node spacing, stimulate root and shoot growth, increase stem thickness, and overall improves the health of your plants. Here's a chart showing recommended DLI for your plant's age. As you can see here, moving into the vegetative phase, we want to have a DLI of around 20 to start with, gradually increasing over the coming weeks to about 45. Going back to our new tent and plant location, if I measure the PAR at the same height as I measured the LUX, I get a PAR measurement of about 325. The DLI can then be calculated based on the number of hours the light is on, in my case 18 on, 6 off, giving us a DLI of 19. So in practice, I place my plants and generally position my light about 18 inches above the top of the canopy. I then will use my PAR meter to fine tune the light intensity and distance above the canopy to attempt to land roughly in the bottom third of those ranges so I don't stress them with the light intensity increase coming out of the cloning tent. In my case, this resulted in the plants being approximately 16 inches above my tallest plant and 22 inches above the smaller plant. I will then note the height of my tallest plants and keep an eye on it as I will generally have to move the light at least weekly to keep it above the top of the canopy and maintain that Goldilocks position. I will also check with the PAR meter and also watch the plants for signs of light stress and gradually increase intensity to get them into the middle of that PAR range. I will also monitor for increased transpiration, which is moisture loss, and increase watering frequency if needed. We mentioned at the beginning of the video ways to deal with plants of different sizes. Now, you cannot completely eliminate some variation between the plants, and so I will use upside-down saucers, additional risers, or even metal baskets to help bring the smaller plant up to the canopy height of the taller plant. You can also engage in what's called topping. We will discuss this further in a future episode, but basically it involves using the taller plant, getting it to the point of the approximate maximum height that you would like it to be in the vegetative stage, and then removing that central growing component right off the top of the stem to stop that vertical growth. The idea then is that the smaller plants will catch up to it over the coming weeks. You'll still probably have a size discrepancy as the plant will continue to grow, uh, but at least this helps control a little bit of that height discrepancy. So there you go. We've got our plants over into our larger tent, our light is positioned, and we're going to let them get settled in as we ramp up nutrients, which we will cover in our next video. If you have found this video helpful, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you have any questions for us or our community, please leave them in the comments section below and consider supporting us on Patreon, where you'll have access to message our cultivators with your specific questions. So that's it for now, and until I see you again, puff puff and pass it on.